Okay, so uh, see, I have. Uh, I hope you have had the opportunity to to uh, 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 watch uh, at least one of the videos I had suggested uh, from the last uh, uh, time the class was taught, uh, specifically on spins. Uh, but um, if you haven't, I encourage you to watch it, uh, and I will um, kind of summarize w what I expect you to know uh, for the rest of the three or four classes we have left. Uh, um, so what we are trying to now pick up is a, a, a conceptual uh, understanding of uh, uh, why is it that uh, uh, you know, a quantity like uh, resistivity or uh, you know, conduct conductance or resistivity uh, can be so precisely quantized uh, in a uh, materials that uh, are, are in, in quantum Hall state in situations where uh, you can choose different materials, different 2D electron gases in uh, different sorts of quantum wells, but still uh, you have a, a part in a parts per billion sort of precision in the resistances of these uh, states. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, this is leading us towards uh, the main topic of today, which is the, uh, the uh, geometric or Berry phase in quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, it is actually kind of interesting that uh, uh, people were able to make the connection that uh, this, this precision uh, of quantization must be related to a phase that was uh, actually missed by the um, people who d discovered and developed quantum mechanics and uh, only was realized in mid-1980s. You know? uh, and so uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, and, and, uh, the, so there's a deep connection between the quantum Hall effect uh, and uh, uh, the Berry phase and topological insulators and this whole class of uh, materials that we're going to talk about for the rest of the lectures. You know? So I uh, had an option to uh, talk, uh, uh, if you look at the old uh, class list of topics, uh, uh, I also had potentially you know, Green's function and Feynman path integral methods. Uh, so I, I thought on the, uh, so compared to those two, uh, which are also extremely useful, uh, this concept is, uh, uh, those are kind of, I would consider to me mathematical techniques that can explain a few things, uh, but they do not explain something fundamentally new. Whereas this is something which is fundamentally new. This is not explainable by, uh, so, so that's why I chose to focus a little bit more on this topic uh, for the rest of the class. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, so the basic idea was uh, you're doing a Hall effect measurement, meaning you're pushing current uh, in the x direction here uh, uh, through a you know current source, and you're measuring voltages both in the x direction and in the y direction, right? And uh, uh, what we uh, so R x y and the R x x are basically R x x is the voltage along you know across these two terminals divided by the current that flows between these two terminals. Whereas R X Y is the voltage, the cross voltage, transverse voltage divided by the current in that direction. So that's the meaning. And and what is quantized here is the transverse uh, resistance or the transverse conductance. So if you take one over that, you get uh, you know uh, that the conductance in the transverse orientation is uh, quantized. Uh, so this is the uh, I'll call it the integer quantum Hall effect, or IQHE, uh, which was discovered in 1980 in a silicon MOSFETs, and since then has been seen in all kinds of two-dimensional electron gases. So, and, and the uh, idea here is uh, the longitudinal conductance, which is rho xy, as we have you know, defined here, uh, the rho xy, which is one over that quantity here, uh, is, is uh, equal to uh, electron charge square over Planck's constant uh, times an integer. Okay. And, uh, and uh, that is not so remarkable if you look at quantized uh, conductance earlier on, you have already done uh, that you know, each 1D mode should carry one, you know, E squared by H conductance. But uh, if you look at the conductances in a 1D in, in a ballistic conductor, in a, in a, in a transistor, uh, the, con the quantization is not very precise. There is noise and then things like that. And you know that uh, go, if you go back and look at the conductance 
uh, you know that there's a, a tunneling probability also involved. If you remember, the current we had written earlier uh, is a sum of uh, electron charge, spin valleys, and etc. But then there is a you know a group velocity. But then there's also a tunneling probability. Right. So if there are any barriers or defects and things like that, that tunneling probability becomes less than one. So it's not very precise. It's very sensitive to if there are defects in the path in, in a traditional conductance method. You know. Even if you have quantization, it's not extremely precise. Uh, and then I I inside these fluctuations are all the details of what, what sort of defects and, and, you know, uh, are leading to the transmission probability and all that. Whereas the quantum Hall effect is extremely precise and it's in some sense completely oblivious to the defects. You know? and, and, and that's the kind of the interesting thing about this. Uh, and then the, what we're trying to understand is why is it so? You know, why is it so? Uh, there's also something called the quantum uh, spin Hall effect, which I will talk briefly mention. Uh, there also, the quantization is not extremely precise. It is you know, somewhat noisier. Uh, you, know, you can see there's 2 e squared by h, and this, this, the, this is essentially your or x, y, if you might, you know. So it should be very flat, but it's not quite, you know. So, yeah. uh, and I'll talk a little bit about those things. So I say, you know, quantum Hall effect is a parts per billion sort of precision in the conductance or the quantization of the conductance, whereas if you look at traditional quantized conductance in a 1D, you know, nanowire or something like that, or in a quantum spin Hall system, which I'm going to mention, uh, it's much, much lower precision compared to the quantum Hall effect. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so so uh, just to kind of remind ourselves uh, uh, that um, we discussed uh, towards kind of the end of the uh, last uh, class we had uh, is that this is the traditional Hall effect where the resistance increases with the magnetic field linearly, and uh, the longitudinal uh, so the longitudinal resistance on the other hand uh, that's called the magneto resistance doesn't change much you know it's roughly flat. Uh, but as you go to large magnetic fields, it, this starts oscillating and that starts, you know, developing these plateaus. And uh, uh, what we also argued is, uh, is if I look into this plateau region of the, so uh, remember the experiment here that we're doing is a two, I've taken a two-dimensional electron gas, okay, of a very high mobility, just going back a little bit again. Uh, I mentioned that, uh, you know, these are very high mobility samples. And I've taken that sort of sample, and I'm doing a very large magnetic field uh, measurement. Uh, magnetic field is perpendicular to the 2D electron gas. And classically, you may consider them, uh, you know, what does a magnetic field do? It, 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 it causes electrons to go in orbits, uh, cyclotron orbits. Okay. Uh, the f you can find the radius of this classically, mm -hmm. right? So, so the, uh, the frequency of a cyclotron orbit uh, is uh, electron charge times the magnetic field over the effective mass of if you are doing uh, you know the electrons in the conduction band of a semiconductor then this is the cyclotron frequency and uh, you correspondingly have a cyclotron energy which is you know h bar times that you know. and you have you can find what is the radius of that circle all that sort of thing you know from from very standard Lorentz force sort of uh, classical picture and uh, deep inside the materials, uh, these electron states are like atoms now. They're bound to, you can imagine they're bound to a magnetic flux quantum or something, but they're not contributing to net current anymore. They're forming closed loops, whereas the ones at the edges are able to skip. And these are skipping orbits or sometimes called edge states or edge, uh, you know, edge modes. So the current flow is, is now occurring in this way. So there's, you know, uh, the edge currents and there's edge currents here and nothing going on inside the bulk. That's the idea. And so the bulk is kind of an insulator. Uh, it is as if there, you have a gas of atoms that are not connected. There's no band between them. Whereas the edge is a conductor. You know? So the conduction is pushed out to the edges now. So this is uh, kind of a carries over to topological insulators. So the, if you have a three-dimensional topological insulator, we'll have the bulk to be an insulator, but the current will all flow on the surface of the, you know, of, of the material, you know, for example. So it's kind of an extension of this idea. Uh, OK, so, so what we had discussed was uh, we had also argued why these states uh, where the Rxx vanishes and the Rxy becomes quantized are actually insulating states, right? Uh, we talked about uh, that if, if, you know, because of the matrix version of it, it's, it's actually the conductance 
uh, sorry, if the conductance along the x-axis is actually zero, right, uh, in in this window, and then therefore uh, what we realize is, as you change the magnetic field uh, in these regions, in these regions uh, you have a quantum Hall insulator state for the uh, RxY, uh, whereas for the RxX uh, it is it is uh, so it's basically a quantum Hall insulator phase. Uh, and in this phase, uh, the picture is the current is flowing only at the edges and uh, not in the bulk anymore. And uh, the um, between them, on the other hand, it's a very standard metal. You know, this is kind of a standard Hall effect, okay? and this is a standard some sort of a magneto resistance. So, yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, this is, this will show what you call a Shumnikov de Haas oscillations. You know, this is, this is the standard Shumnikov de Haas in the longitudinal resistance, uh, and then that is a standard Hall resistance. So it's going between a very interesting phase, which is insulating, and a normal phase, which is metal and insulator and metal and so on. So, so, so this is uh, these transitions are occurring with the magnetic field. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of a new, like so the insulating phase looks like it has zero resistance in the x x direction. That's right. So we remember exactly we had we had asked whether it is a superconductor, and we said. Or it's a, because there is zero resistance. Yeah. So, so. But then, uh, if you actually look at the geometry of the problem now, you write the currents as this. Okay, so the idea is uh, your R X X or rho X X is actually zero. You know? So now, if you want to find the conductance, right, uh, you must write. If you want to find the conductance along the X direction, the J X is rho X X times this plus that times that, right? And if rho xx is uh, and equal to rho yy, both are equal to zero, that implies that you know uh, rho x, the conductance along x, is actually must be written like that. You know? okay. And these these are zero, but that is not zero. Rho xy is not zero, whereas this and this are zero. So essentially, you, you get the conductance okay. is zero. So by this definition, uh, there is really no conductance. And indeed, the idea is. Uh, it's not like there is no current flowing. There's, there are edge states flowing here. But uh, again, I mean, this, this is a physical phenomena. What you call it is a separate matter, really, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but in, in, with this definition, it's an insulator. That's why we call it a quantum Hall insulator phase. Uh, yeah, that's, and, and in pictorially, you form the Landau levels. And this occurs when the Fermi level is between two Landau levels, you know, when the Fermi level is in, in a gap. And what it's saying is when your Fermi level is in the gap between two Landau levels, you can consider them as two bands now. Uh, there is no current this way, but there is definitely a current laterally. So, so, and and, and that, that's what it's trying to kind of, uh, indicate. And that current is you know, quantized uh, with the precision of a part per billion sort of thing. And that's why uh, we are trying to use this to motivate the, this whole concept of very phase. Uh, and uh, so I'll talk about that. Uh, you know why? Why? Uh, so what we will find is that uh, this quantity here, this integer, uh, is is going to become what's called as the churn number, uh, and this is uh, a geometric. Basically, uh, uh, geometrically, it is it is uh, uh, guaranteed to be an integer. You know, it could be zero, could be one, two, three, uh, but it cannot be one point five or one point two. This is guaranteed to be an integer, and we'll give the proof for it today uh, you know, as to why. And that comes from the Berry phase as well. Uh, and it's kind of a very interesting concept. Uh, uh, and, and, and it underlies quite a few other things as well. So I want to kind of spend some time with that. You know. uh, one of the things I would mention also is, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, if you had a chance to uh, look at the ideas of spin. I just will, I wanted to just do a very quick summary of spin because I'm going to use it not not immediately, but at some point uh, after, a little bit later. Uh, uh, the the reason for that is uh, you know an electron uh, comes with uh, uh, four fundamental parameters attached to it. You know? And there is the mass of the. Remember, we are doing quantum transport of electrons in this course primarily, so we kind of look at what are its you know different phases or personalities. So there's the mass of the electron, right? What are the other quantities that that characterize an electron, for example? Uh, right, so there's that, that mass, charge, right, spin, <coughs> spin is an angular momentum, okay, and a free electron, these are the three main parameters. But if an electron is inside a crystal, inside a solid, it also has K, 
you know, which is the quasi moment or the crystal momentum. That's the fourth quantity that uh, in a crystal uh, characterizes an electron. There are four quantities really. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, just one sec. Uh, yeah, you had a question? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the, the Chern number is telling you how many uh, Landau levels are occupied? Uh, actually, no. Uh, we'll, we'll see that this is related not to the Landau level, how many Landau levels, but it's related to uh, actually the how many vortices. I'll talk about it and we'll see what it is exactly. Yeah. So there are four quantities uh, that are intimately attached to an electron uh, that's in a crystal, in a solid, in a semiconductor, metal, or whatever have you. Uh, uh, if you have just an uh, individual atom, there is no K associated with it. You know, this K comes because it, it, it has uh, the possibility to move uh, between, hop between atoms uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a lattice and so on, right? So uh, uh, in other words, if I were to kind of sketch uh, the EK diagram, uh, now this is very general idea, I mean, uh, not necessarily limited to uh, what we are talking about at this point uh, about quantum hall, but it's very general idea. So. Uh, if I look at E versus K, uh, then I, uh, of course I can have uh, you know bands that may look like a valence band and, and a conduction band, right? Uh, uh, sorry, it's at the minimum. And uh, each state here uh, can have up spin or down spin, and the value of K is uh, 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 you know it gets this K value because uh, it's in a crystal. Uh, Remember, the tight binding model says that if you're not in a crystal, all the electron energies would be bunched around here. And you put it in a crystal, it spreads out because of hopping, and then it, these are the values of k allowed here, right? So, so uh, and you can kind of ask what, what, where did the, you know, each of these parameters came from, right? Uh, so we talked a little bit about k, but the mass of the electron, that's kind of a regime of high energy physics. You know, electrons are formed of quarks and, you know, that sort of thing. And, and uh, if you electrons uh, have their kind of exact opposite, which are called positrons, and then this was predicted by Dirac uh, and discovered a few years after that. So in a condensed matter system, we are not typically changing the mass of the electron. You know? uh, the mass of the electron, the full you know, free electron mass is the free electron mass. Now, if you are looking at the effective mass, then it's related to the curvature here. Right? But, but the electron is a full electron. It's not you know, lost any of its mass inside a crystal. It is it's a full electron, right? Its motion may be impeded because it's in a crystal and or maybe has to, or, you know, sped up, but it's not, a, it's a full electron. So we are not changing the mass of the electron inside a crystal. The charge of the electron itself, electron itself is always minus 1.6 times into minus 19 coulombs. And the charge comes from also, it's a kind of a high energy phenomena related to the phase and you know, that sort of thing. And Dirac also kind of had a very good argument as to why every electron measured in the whole universe always has the same charge. You know? uh, uh, sorry, I, I said mass. So mass is, uh, I, I, I use the Coulomb. So charge is 1.6 times you know, minus 9 in Coulombs. And uh, so we are not changing the charge, but we can mimic you know, a combination of these two by looking at either the conduction band or the valence band. Because you know, if you look at the valence band, you can consider it to be a positive charge. A missing electron in the valence band may appear like a positive charge. But as far as electrons themselves go, we are not changing their charge in a crystal. They are fixed. Now, spin and momentum are very interesting quantities. These two, you can really uh, do a lot with them inside a crystal. You know, spin and momentum. Uh, you know, and and uh, uh, spin is an angular momentum. It's you know intrinsic angular momentum, and uh, this is a linear momentum. So, what I mean to say now is, uh, uh, so the spin. I'll just go through a very quick uh, kind of uh, you know summary. Uh, I, I, I just want to repeat that uh, if you get a chance to watch uh, uh, the video, if you haven't, uh, if you watch the video of uh, description of spin of electron, how how it was discovered, please uh, do watch it. Or if you you know, uh, can read up uh, your previous uh, materials, uh, strongly suggest you do. So essentially the idea of spin was it was discovered when, uh, you know, people were shooting, um, you know, neutral atoms through a region which had a gradient in a magnetic field and they saw that the atoms would split into two, two beams. You know, exactly two beams, not five, you know, these atoms would split into two beams. And then if you put it again in the same sort of magnet, it would always remain one, you know, not, not split anymore. 
And uh, these are neutral atoms, and uh, essentially, uh, then, uh, and then on the other hand, if you classically throw some, you know, magnets through it, which of course have north and south poles, right? Uh, they can uh, every time, you know, you can. Uh, so, so essentially, the, the, from here, the idea was born that uh, there's some intrinsic magnetic moment inside an atom, a neutral atom itself, which is non. You know, uh, if you put those atoms together, it's not like you're forming a ferromagnet, but intrinsically there's some intrinsic, you know, uh, angular momentum. And uh, that led to the evidence of spin. And uh, initially, uh, you know, Pauli introduced this idea that I can, how do you consider that in quantum mechanics? This was around the time when quantum mechanics was being developed. And the idea of spin was, you can forget about the rest of the terms here, just consider the first, you know, uh, first term, which is the spinless, you know, if, if, if the particle had no spin, this would be the Hamiltonian. And if you have a spin, it would interact with the magnetic field in this way. And, and uh, uh, the, uh, the Hamiltonian essentially due to spin will be equal to Hamiltonian without spin plus, uh, you know, this uh, factor uh, which is called the Bohr magneton. It's kind of an intrinsic angular, you know, spin or magnetic moment of an electron uh, times uh, what are called the Pauli spin matrices times dot product with the magnetic field. You know, so uh, so this is how the energies change in the presence of spin uh, for an electron. And then there's some spin orbit terms later, which we don't need to worry about at this point. You know. So, uh, uh, and these Pauli spin matrices are three matrices, and this is going to be kind of important for the rest of the classes. Uh, uh, so there's uh, row X, and these are all two by two matrices, row Y and uh, row Z. There are three matrices, uh, which, uh, you know, look like thi this, and uh, there are various bases, but, you know, you choose a basis and you, you know, go with it. Uh, so row X and row Y, uh, let me just write them down, I think, I'll just so minus i is zero, something like that, and uh, uh, this one is what? Zero one minus one. Zero one minus one zero, something like. Zero one one. Zero one one zero. Okay, good. So, so this is a basis of uh, the Pauli spin matrices. I have uh, that kind of written up also sometime here. Okay, so row x, zero one one zero, right? Thank you. Uh, row y is. 0 minus i, i, 0, maybe I have a sign flip, and rho z is this. These are, these are the three, three Pauli matrices. And, and, and the basic idea was uh, because uh, the atom beam split into two, then you know, before it came in, uh, if I write its wave function as a, as a scalar quantity, that's not quite right. The wave function itself should have a two component feature, you know, like a one zero times you know, something which is n uh, no spin, for example. So this is kind of a spin index of the wave function. It's a two component. So it's not a scalar anymore. It's kind of a, it's this is called a spinner, you know, meaning kind of a, almost a matrix, if you might, right? So, uh, and uh, so the wave function is written as a two component quantity now, and these are the spin matrices, and this is the magnetic field. This is the real magnetic field, whatever you apply, Bx times x plus By times y plus Bz times z. Is, you know, in Tesla's you know, the external magnetic field that you apply, and you take a dot product with these, and that's how the wave function will change because of this dot product. You will get a two-component two quantity. You, know. you, you get a four, uh, two by two times a two by one. Uh, sorry, uh, you take essentially you will always get a you know two-component feature here of the wave function, right? It's a dot product, right? So, uh, and uh, uh, let me just also mention, and the fourth. Uh, two by two matrix of very uh, high importance is is the identity matrix one zero zero one, and uh, and if you actually take these and you square them, you know what will you get? If I take square of this matrix, what will I get? Uh, you know row x squared. I'll get this. You know so so right. If you take square of any of these, you will get that. You know so in other words, uh, just like you know if you take square root of one, you get plus minus one, right? This is the square root of one, zero, zero, one. This is the square root of a matrix. These three, are, these are all square roots of matrices now. Yeah? And then this is, if you remember Dirac's uh, major contributions were all related to somehow taking square roots of strange quantities, and this is one of them again. So he's taking, uh, so essentially uh, Pauli introduced this ad hoc, saying that if I do this, I can explain all experimental phenomena. 
But then Dirac was really trying to figure out why do we have to do it? What is the origin of it in the first place? You know, and and uh, that that's where he he led into led into various kinds of interesting things. I'll I'll just mention them briefly, but not spend too much time. Uh, now, if you take this uh, and let's say without the spin, the eigenvalues of the system were just E naught, whatever you know, some energy of the. Uh, it could be the energy of this state or energy of a electron in a hydrogen atom. You know, so so this is. I'm going to now sketch how does the energy look as a function of magnetic field I apply. You know, so okay, that's what I wanted. So quantum mechanical energy. If there's no magnetic field, you know, the spin is not seeing anything, so you just get your energy. Now, and let's say I have two states. You know, E zeros, the two states. You know, both of them have the same energy. Now I turn on the magnetic field. And what this does is, uh, uh, you know, when you take the eigenvalues of this, you will get it will split into two, you know, plus mu b, and minus mu b. The absolute value of sigma is one. You know. So the eigenvalues, uh, because of the splitting, will look like that, you know. And this is called the Zeeman splitting. You know. The Zeeman splitting, and the separation here is two times the Bohr magneton times the magnetic field. Very simple, you know. So you can calculate how much is the splitting, milli EV, micro EV, whatever be on the magnetic field, and this is what's used, you know, if you apply a large magnetic field, and if you take, for example, NMR and all that spectroscopy is done using transitions between these two states. Now, you know, so, so for example, but but uh, what is interesting here is now you have an external parameter like a, a, here is the magnetic field, and you ch change it. And you can change the eigenvalues of the system, you know, quantum mechanically, uh, right? Yeah, you can turn it back down, and it will go back, to, you know, go, go back to its original values. You know. And this is very interestingly related to the Berry phase. We'll see that how are the eigenvalues of a system, how do they change based on an external parameter? And then, you know, if you bring it back to itself, what happens? Is it the same state? Is has it changed? And things like that. We're going to talk about that now. But this is an example of a. Uh, so I, I, you can see this is not the right plot because as you increase the magnetic field, it will keep increasing. Here, right? so, yeah. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, I don't want to kind of get into all the numbers here, but you can calculate what is the you know Bohr magneton is related to Planck's constant charge and mass and all that sort of thing. So it's uh, you know fundamental quantities, and you can calculate how much is splitting here. Now, if your crystal, if your electrons are not in a, a vacuum or in, in an atom, but in a crystal then you get another term which is called the spin orbit term essentially now the electrons cannot be uh, so so the crystal uh, you know imposes on it certain directions it can move in and certain you know so it, and as a result uh, you get the second term and then you get what's called an effective g factor so essentially uh, you can get a factor here which uh, you know this is very qualitative what i'm saying here they get a g times that and the splitting can be very large in some materials, uh, indium antimonide and indium arsenide. This it can be 40 times that in a normal state, you know. So so it can you can kind of increase the splitting by a large amount in some semiconductors and some crystals like that. You know? uh, okay. So uh, and and uh, these four uh, uh, um, just kind of getting back. These four matrices are going to be uh, very important for what we are going to do later. Uh, I told you one of its properties. There are quite a few others. If I take, you know, sigma x times sigma y and its commutator, I get this. You know, all kinds of things. They are, they are, they form a very interesting, you know, uh, 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 meaning they have some very useful commutator properties and and, and such things as well. Uh, uh, okay, I wanted to briefly mention how Dirac. Uh, you know, found uh, or rather, what is the reason for for these matrices to appear? And that actually has to do. Uh, you have to step out of quantum mechanics there to understand where it comes from, and that has to do with relativity. You know, and and uh, uh, that was what you know the, the 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 video the lecture was about. I mentioned, and I, I don't want to. I have no intention of spending much time on this, except just to say that uh, you know, special relativity. Uh, so remember, relativity was uh, originally uh, developed to understand uh, um, not microscopic, you know, quantum theory, but to uh, understand uh, uh, electromagnetism and classical mechanics, you know, which are, you know, um, 
uh, heavy objects and you know uh, and uh, how light interacts with objects and that sort of thing, but not so much in for for quantum mechanics. Uh, and and the idea of relativity is actually very uh, the crux of the idea is very simple that that uh, uh, you know if we are uh, the velocity of any object, uh, because it's a transport course, uh, the velocity is very important, right? And the, but the relativity says that the velocity of any object is uh, not absolute. Uh, it depends on who's observing it, right? Uh, so uh, clearly, if you're moving very fast in a car and another car is moving at the same speed as you, you are not moving with respect to them. That's very, you know, that's something appeals to our intuition, and we understand that. In fact, physically. Uh, 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 the velocity uh, transforms linearly. Uh, you know, uh, this was the early theory of relativity before Einstein. That if I am uh, an observer and you are moving with a speed w and I'm moving with speed v, then I see you moving w minus v. This is the, what's called the Galilean relativity. And uh, and and so if velocity is not absolute, then uh, uh, and and from here you can also understand that acceleration, on the other hand, is absolute. It's a force on an object, and that's absolute. Uh, and, and if you are, both objects are moving with you know, constant velocities, uh, any force, uh, actually any force uh, observed by one observer in one frame will translate to the same force for another observer in another frame if you take Galilean re relativity to account. Right? And uh, so, but then the end of the 19th century, uh, as you know, you know, Faraday and Maxwell, specific, specifically Maxwell equation, manufactured or in kind of explain uh, a velocity which is the speed of light and uh, and there was nothing relative about it it was you know so so basically what popped out of the maxwell's equations is the speed of light and this is a velocity right and einstein kept asking what is you know who is this velocity for for which reference frame right and that's what bothered him all you know a lot he didn't understand it and you is like if i'm moving uh, at the speed of light, can I see my image in a mirror? And all these kind of, he was thinking about these questions for a long time. And uh, then essentially, uh, uh, there were experiments by Michelson and Morley where, where they were trying to measure the speed of light when the earth is rotating and the light is coming this way compared to, you know, earth is moving that way. So was, they were doing measurements of C plus V and C minus V, you know, sort of thing for speed of light. And uh, every measurement that was ever done with the speed of light found that uh, the speed of light is absolute. It really doesn't depend on the observer. And that's very strange, right? Uh, because that really goes against the Galilean sort of concept of relativity. And so Einstein uh, turned this picture completely around. Uh, in fact, you know, Lorentz and others had also uh, realized that. Uh, so they said that uh, let's not uh, experimentally, we are forced to conclude that uh, that a velocity of light is a constant and it doesn't depend on the observer. You know? uh, meaning no matter how fast you are moving, you know, w w uh, you're, you, you, when you measure speed of light, it will always be three times 10 over eight meters per second for you, no matter how fast you are moving. Right? And no matter which way is the light moving with respect to you, it's always going to be three times 10 over eight meters per second. And the second, uh, uh, another postulate that they used, uh, which is actually a very, if you think deeply about it, it's a very interesting postulate, uh, and that all observers that are in inertial frames, like if I'm in a frame, I'm moving with constant velocity, another observer, they're moving with constant velocity. If I do some physical measurements here, maybe transport measurement, maybe mechanical measurement, maybe you know any other measurement, all the laws that I discover, be it laws of mechanics or electromagnetism or quantum mechanics, all the laws I discover moving at say rest, uh, the other person moving at half the speed of light, but at constant velocity, the laws will be exactly the same. You know? Physical laws will, are invariant, you know, based on. Uh, so based on these, uh, they, they were able, able to write down uh, what is very interesting that uh, you must now change. If the velocity is constant, all the components that go into the velocity, uh, like the length, like time, all have to warp now. They have to change in order to satisfy that relation. And, and uh, the way distance or length transforms from one frame to another frame where the frame is moving with speed v transforms like that, you know. And the time transforms like that. So th all these things must transform. And uh, velocities must also transform such that, uh, you know, the, net, the relative velocities look like this now. So that's kind of the major idea of special relativity. And it's one of the most beautiful subjects because you do not need any advanced mathematics to understand it. It's you know quadratic equations. You know that's all you need to know to understand special relativity. 
Uh, but then, you know, these are the three major uh, transformations that, that are called Lorentz transformations because he had realized it already before Einstein. So. But Einstein really took it very far because he said that, well, uh, with these transforms, how do the laws of mechanical transport change now? You know, Newton's law and all that, how do they change, right? And so when he went into that, uh, actually, uh, just before that, uh, <laughs> Another concept is that uh, the length of a vector, you know, vector uh, of x, let's say, a length in, if I'm measuring the length here uh, and I change the coordinate system, right, the length of a vector doesn't change, right? But now the length and time are mixed up, you know, space and time are mixed up, right? So now the question is, uh, if, if, if this is so, what is invariant when I go to another reference frame, right? And then that is, is called the Minkowski term. Uh, the vector is, is uh, speed of light times time squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. So this is the metric that doesn't change from one frame to another. So this is called the Minkowski metric. Uh, and uh, this is very important because uh, this, this quantity uh, uh, helped uh, Einstein to formulate the, you know, E is equal to mc squared and that sort of thing uh, in a couple of steps from here. Again, I'm going through this a little fast, but uh, please watch uh, the video or read up, uh, you know, some of the terms, um, you know, re uh, uh, some uh, s supporting materials if you want to dig deeper into this. So basically all these quantities, space and time, uh, time get mixed up and you f formulate what's called a four vector. You, know, you cannot write, uh, if you want to take relativity into account in anything you do, uh, you must consider this four vector instead of space and time separately. You know? and, and this four vector has time and space as well in you know, all four components. And then you can ask now uh, uh, what is the, uh, uh, what is the, for example, velocity and then you get a four velocity. You know? Velocity has four components. One is related to time, the other three to space. You know? And this is called a four velocity. And now it has speed of light and uh, you know, all, all these components is the square root of one minus v square by c square down there. Finally, now we're getting into real transport uh, aspects. What is the momentum? Momentum is mass times four velocity. And then you get this quantity here. You know? And uh, what Einstein realized is the first term here is what leads to the rest energy of a particle, which is mc e is equal to mc square. And the rest of it is the kinetic momentum, you know, which is due to the velocity speed of physical speed uh, of, of, of a particle. Uh, in other words, if, if the particle was not moving at all, the V would be zero, but it, is, it would still have this, this part left, you know, and, and that's E is equal to mc squared, the rest uh, momentum of this one. Okay, so what has this got to do with, re uh, with, with uh, quantum and, and Pauli spin matrices uh, is, is the following. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over a few things here. Uh, so you know that the Schrodinger equation, uh, which, which we have used in the beginning of the course and throughout uh, to write down transport equations and to write down wave functions and to write quantum, tr you know, transport e expressions for the J in the quantum mechanically. Uh, you also notice that there is time and space, but there's no speed of light. So that means it is not consistent with relativity, the Schrodinger equation. And, and that is true. It is not consistent with relativity. Uh, and uh, Dirac was really trying to, to uh, merge the two, make quantum mechanics consistent with relativity. And, and uh, uh, so one of the major results you get in, in, from Einstein's picture is that the total energy of a particle is mc squared whole squared plus momentum times speed of light whole squared. You know? So the total energy, you can write it as a square root So the, uh, <laughs> all of them are given up here. <laughs> okay, so E is, sorry. C squared plus MC squared whole squared. So, uh, so the total energy uh, now is inside a square root and that's a bit of a problem again. Uh, because uh, you, you see your energy term in, so this is the result of special relativity, that any particle with a mass m, rest mass m, uh, and momentum at p, 
this is the total energy of a particle. So, so uh, the speed of light is enters explicitly now, and, and this is consistent with relativity. It's a result of relative, uh, special relativity. But uh, your Schrodinger equation, uh, you know, your energy term uh, uh, e psi. So essentially, this this must be modified now to include the square root term, right? That energy. But now your momentum, which is uh, written as i you know, h bar d by dx is inside the square root, and square root of an operator is a problem again, you know. So, so that's what uh, Dirac was trying to resolve. Uh, you know, there are some intermediate steps. You can write, you know, energy minus p squared and all that sort of thing like that. Uh, it's not terribly important, but what is very important is, sorry, is uh, what Dirac found was uh, to make it consistent, your wave function cannot be a scalar quantity anymore. You know, the, the wave function uh, for, for your Schrodinger equation is cannot be a scalar quantity, and it cannot even be a two two component. It has to be a four component vector. You know? That's what he found to be able to write the energy like that. You know? And that's uh, called the Dirac equation uh, for the electron. It kind of looks a little complicated, but really, if you go through this argument, you'd realize that there are four four by four matrices, and they inside them are sitting the Pauli spin matrices. You know? So that's where spin really comes from uh, for for uh, uh, for uh, electrons uh, in general, you know? so and this is uh, kind of a birth of very large number of you know uh, areas of physics as well, and uh, also uh, it underlies a lot of the topological materials and that sort of thing. This idea of uh, uh, where uh, so essentially what he was trying to do was write this this operator uh, 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 as as a square of a you know, uh, x, y, and z. So remember, this is your gradient operator in the Hamiltonian, you know, del by del x squared plus del by del y squared. And he was trying to make it consistent with relativity, which forces you to have this term. You know. And then he was writing it like that. And then he, has, he had to choose a, b, c, and d. He required four. He thought it would be numbers, but it ended up Mathematically, you cannot do that with numbers. You have to, these are all four by four matrices, and the Pauli spin matrices are a component of that. You know, this comes up from there. So, what Dirac equation predicts is if you solve it, you get four components. The top two components of the Dirac uh, wave function. Uh, okay, so you have four components here now: one, two, three, and four. The top two components are actually for an electron with uh, you know energy of uh, m c squared over h bar t. You know, this is basically e to the power minus i e over h bar, you know, the time evolution term. And just writing it that way. And, and so this part is for the electron. But there was also another part, you know, the lower two parts. That was for a new kind of particle that this equation predicted, which is called the positron. You know, it has the opposite, uh, uh, it's antimatter. You know, it's antimatter. Uh, and uh, when he proposed this, uh, he was actually kind of ridiculed that what is this stuff? I mean, what is this antimatter stuff? But basically, two or three years after that, it was experimentally observed, the positrons, which were predicted by the theory, you know, which is kind of pretty really amazing, I think. And now they're used for all kinds of you know, tomography, medical purposes, PET, you know, positron annihilation uh, measurements, measuring defects in semiconductors, you use positrons and that sort of thing. So, so uh, OK, so that's the history of. Uh, uh, where the Pauli spin matrices come come in, uh, and, uh, uh, and and they are tied to the very existence of the electron itself. This is kind of what I'm trying to say at all. And it is one of the fundamental quantities about the electron here. Right? So spin. Yeah. Now, uh, now that being said, uh, if I look at the uh, spin and uh, I look at uh, its uh, so. What does that mean uh, to transport? Okay, so the mass of an electron, I'm not being able, uh, not able to change it inside a crystal. It's a, you know unless I am talking about mc square sort of energies. You know, I'm not able to kind of change that. If I accelerate an electron really fast at close to speed of light, like in a particle accelerator at chess, then you can change the mass. You can make it convert into light or something like that. But if I'm not, if I'm moving relatively slowly, you know, one three hundred speed of light, it's not going to change much. Charge, not much. Spin is uh, uh, related to uh, you know a v over c. You know, that's that's the quantity that controls spin, and or, or v over c squared. Right? So if your speed 
of electron is very fast compared to, meaning if, even if you get close to 1 over 50 or 1 over 100 of the speed of light, this can have measurable effects you know, in, a, in a crystal itself. It's small, but it can have a, a measurable effect. And as a result, the spin is susceptible to dephasing. You know, if it's moving in a crystal, the environment of the crystal can change the spin of a material. You know. And finally, you have momentum. The momentum is based on how you have arranged the atoms in a crystal, you know, and that's the crystal momentum, right? And you know that the momentum uh, is uh, dependent because the crystal at room temperature is vibrating, right? So the momentum can deface very easily, you know. And, and you have calculated what is the momentum scattering time, right? right? So you can find out how often is the momentum change in the particle. Right? So momentum, uh, if, uh, so in some crystals, you can have two valleys. You know? so, so you can have a valley index like that. So just like you have two spins up and down, you can have two valleys or more valleys. You know? So you can, what I'm trying to say is, if you create situations that the momentum doesn't deface, then the valley can also be another index for, you know, for its, I can say I have electrons in this valley or that valley, and, and, and then I can do some stuff with it. But because of vibrations, uh, of the crystal, the momentum is also dephased, and you easily scatter from one valley to another. You know, with, 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 with the path of yeah. yeah. Uh, you, said, you said the spins related to v over c squared. Is it like that square root of one minus v over c squared? Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Most of the times it will appear as as that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But you know, uh, uh, I right. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. So uh, now. Uh, so the reason I'm saying that is uh, when you, uh, this Hall effect that we talked about, there are uh, going to be four kinds we want to talk about. Uh, so let's see. Can you detect the charge of an electron by a Hall effect measurement? This is the question for you. Charge of a particle, forget electron. Charge of a particle using Hall effect. Yes, you know, that's kind of the first origin of the Hall effect. If I have electro positive charges moving, they go one way. The negative charge moving, they go the other way, right? So the voltage, a sign of the voltage gives you the, the, uh, uh, the Hall effect. I mean, the Hall effect, the, the sign of the Hall voltage gives you the charge of the, of the particle that's moving. So uh, what I wanted to say is the Hall effect will come in many varieties. There's the ordinary Hall effect, which tells you what is the charge. You know? And then when you ramp it up to very high magnetic fields, you get the integer quantum Hall effect. Okay? That's the you know IQ. That's what we are talking about at this point. You know what's the reason for this precision and all that. Now what's interesting is uh, you can also get uh, a Hall effect in the absence of magnetic fields. You know, and then that's called the spin Hall effect. Okay. Spin Hall effect. Now Hall effect was discovered. Ordinary Hall effect was discovered in 1880s, 1890s. This was discovered in around 2000, you know, just 10, 15 years ago, the spin Hall effect. What is the spin Hall effect? Electrons are going in a crystal, and due to an electric field, because of internal spin orbit interactions, you know, electrons go one way and the holes go the other way, or, some, you know, or, or sorry, no, forget about electrons and holes. Spin up electrons go one way, spin down electrons go the other way. So you have a spin splitting because of an internal electric field. No magnetic field, zero external magnetic field. That's called the spin Hall effect. Then you can create some interesting crystals where you get, this gets quantized too. That's called the quantum spin Hall effect. You know? This is even newer, like 2007 or 2008, you know, a few years ago. It's called quantum spin Hall effect. And uh, uh, the example of that is what I was showing you uh, here. Uh, this is the Q quantum spin Hall effect. Uh, I think this was 2007, um, measured in a quantum well, uh, 2D electron gas uh, made out of very heavy spin orbit interaction materials. This is quantized. You know? so, so that's it. Yeah. Do you, do, so you still need a high degree of spin orbit coupling to have, have measurable spin Hall effect? Uh, yes. Uh, spin Hall effect uh, will, have, will occur in all materials that have spin orbit interaction. The question is how much of it is there and whether its uh, signal is above the noise that you measure. So yeah. Absolutely. So wherever there's spin, uh, spin orbit coupling, you get spin all effect. And the third is uh, uh, is the momentum. Okay, and that's called the valley Hall effect. You know, uh, Hall effect. And this was uh, one of the first experiments that was done uh, here at Cornell. Uh, uh, and then this is where you have electrons in two valleys, 
and you are they're flowing across and then you know electrons in one valley go this way electrons in the other valley go that way that's a valley hall effect uh, also can be uh, uh, right so so that's, that's, uh, the quantum part of it is not yet been observed but probably soon right uh, now these are uh, rather special materials typically you know quantum spin hall and all that and they are very closely related to the ideas we are going to cover for the rest of the course here so this is a whole zoo of hall effects you can see you know, from the ordinary to spin hall to valley hall and all kinds of things. Now, as you go, the reason I, I, I also mentioned to you, this is extremely robust. The integer quantum hall effect is very robust. And the reason for that also, I think, is because the charge is something you cannot really change. It's of high energy, you know, protected by high energies, you know. Whereas spin, you can change if you are moving fast enough because of the reasons I mentioned, you know, V over C. And uh, K is the most susceptible because the lattice is vibrating and, and you're you know, susceptible to dephasing it more. So these are a little harder to observe. This is very robust. You know, so. That's kind of a very loosely, uh, loose uh, or uh, crude reasoning why these are not very precise, but this is extremely precise. You know, so. okay. okay, so now let's go uh, ahead and, and really talk about uh, the re reason for the quantization. I, wa I wanted to take a detour to give you a bigger picture of where where does the integer quantum Hall effect lie? And, uh, and, and, and now we'll talk a little bit about the Berry phase. Uh, uh, and uh, I will start, I'll start with the results uh, and then uh, derive the results. Okay, so. so what are we talking about? We are trying to now explain what is the origin of the robustness of integer quantum Hall effect. I'm not talking about the rest of the two at this point. And uh, I have already mentioned uh, earlier in this class that, uh, uh, you know, if you look at your classical uh, uh, you know, law of motion transport of any particle in an electromagnetic field, your momentum and uh, you know, uh, rate of change of momentum, Newton's law, is equal to the force, right? Uh, electric force and magnetic force. And the magnetic force is V cross B, uh, Lorentz sort of picture, and this is the electric force. Right? Uh, now, on the other hand, if you go to a band picture, uh, we have talked about the rate of change of space. I mean, this is our group velocity. We have talked about that. So you see, we are taking time derivative of momentum here, and there's a spatial derivative of potential and a time derivative of x. So p and x uh, sitting there, and x basically x is in the denominator here and in the numerator here. So here, you are taking again a time derivative, a rate of evolution of x, and you have a k in the denominator. K can be interchange with momentum p, right? h bar times k is p. But there's nothing here. And this, there's, there's you know, something missing here is what I mean to say. And, uh, uh, and actually, already in 1950s, uh, uh, La, you know, uh, Joachim Lattinger and uh, Cohn and Karplus, they had found, looking at the block equations, uh, the missing component. They had already found it, except that you know, till nineteen mid nineteen eighties, people didn't know what this quantity was called. I mean, this is the Berry phase. You know. They had already found it in transport studies back in nineteen fifties, but uh, it was not a thing in quantum mechanics, so they didn't recognize what, what should we call it or what what is it actually, right? So uh, I'm saying that the Berry phase, uh, this this quantity that appears here. Let's just look at this equation. So what you get here is charge over Planck's constant, electric field vector external electric field vector, cross product with what's called the Berry curvature. This is called the Berry curvature, and we're going to derive that today. Uh, and um, so the rate of change of, uh, or rather your velocity term for any quantum mechanical state now depends on what's called the normal you know, group velocity term plus this Berry curvature term. This, is the, uh, this was so somewhat missing in, in the uh, most solid state physics books also wouldn't have it today. You know, so. Uh, and uh, but but this is what leads uh, and explains all many of these other things that we talked about now. In addition, there's things like anomalous Hall effect as transport in ferromagnets and all the magnetization, polarization, all that stuff is explained by this term. Whereas this term explains everything we have talked about in this course till now. You know? So uh, right, including you know uh, everything we talked about semiconductors and also with superconductors. I mean, so it explains all that stuff. So. Uh, Okay, so uh, this quantity here, uh, the Berry curvature, uh, uh, is is uh, the units of it. You can you know figure out from here directly from unit argument is its square of its area. You know uh, this quantity will have units of area, and uh, uh, and velocity of course as units of uh, 
of uh, 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 meters per second. Okay, so. And uh, uh, so just remember the curvature has units of area. <clears throat> I haven't told you exactly what it is yet, um, but uh, you know there is this missing term is what I want to kind of say. And this term is uh, uh, something that is defined. Uh, this term is uh, not a property of what you do externally to the material. It's a property of the material itself. You know the way the atoms are arranged, the crystal itself. It's an intrinsic property of the crystal in which the electron is sitting. It's an intrinsic property. It is related to the band structure and the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Uh, so, so that's what it's related to. And we'll, we'll go through a derivation of it now. Uh, what I said now is actually an important thing because sometimes the confusion that, oh, is the very phase something you generate from outside? No, it's intrinsic property of the material itself. You know? So either the material has a very phase or it doesn't, you know? so, or very curvature or it doesn't. You know? So, so that's that's uh, it's a it, it's just like the band gap and the effective mass and all those other quantities that characterize a material. The Berry curvature is another quantity that should characterize the material itself, and and its transport properties as a result. So now uh, what we are going to do is do a little derivation. Uh, we can uh, uh, so I have a full formula for it. By the way, I'll gi I'll give you a handout of two chapters for the rest of a really nice book uh, from where I took some of the materials to because it explains these things nicely. And I'm going to follow some aspects of it, but also talk a little bit of what I think uh, from my perspective. And I'll post them, post these two chapters in the class website so you can download and read that up. Uh, so anyway, there's an expression that looks complicated, but let me kind of give uh, uh, intuitive uh, heuristic derivation of what is the Berry curvature and wh where does it come from in the first place. Right? So, OK. Uh, so. Uh, so uh, as we know, uh, the basic idea of uh, any quantum mechanical system is where we, we throw electrons into a, you know, into a into a material with with certain, you know, crystal or, uh, or arrangement of atoms and all that. And now we say, what are the allowed energies and what are the allowed eigenfunctions for the electron? And uh, uh, that the solution for eigenvalues gives you the band structure, right? And for each state here. Uh, uh, I have a wave function associated with it, right? So an eigenfunction and an eigenvalue, right? So this form a set of uh, uh, parameters that completely characterize all possibilities of an electron in a crystal. And what are the possible quantum states of, a, of an electron? It could be with very low momentum and have this energy, or it can be a momentum of this much and have that energy, or so on. Right? So this, this is these are the two quantities that characterize, in other words, k comma that will characterize the state, quantum state of that electron. Right? Now, uh, we also have talked about the wave function is actually, you can consider it as a vector in a Hilbert space. right? It's a vector in a Hilbert space. You can think of it that way. And if you think of it that way, uh, you can start asking some very interesting questions about this vector, okay? some very interesting questions. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, one of the specific questions you can ask is uh, about the phase of the wave function. You know? And then, uh, um, OK, so I will just come to the phase. Uh, before that, let me just point out that uh, in summary of uh, the classical mechanics, this is the you know, law of transport of classical mechanics, right? We have talked about that. And that is minus the gradient of uh, a potential that you may, you know, subject uh, the the particle to. Right? The force is if you have a, you know, hill, the ball rolls down the hill, right? So that's the idea. The gradient of a potential is what drives the transport, right? So this is classical mechanics. Now, e electromagnetics is also like that, except you have uh, because if your particle has a charge, you know, this is true for whether your particle has charge or no charge. I mean, right? But if your particle has charge, you get a little extra or other, you know, th these extra terms, right? And I want to kind of build up where does Berry phase lie in the grand scheme of things, you know, how does it relate? So I want to mention specifically that Berry phase also occurs in classical systems, not necessarily only quantum, you know, so it's a very important quantity. So uh, uh, here uh, uh, you can write this as minus gradient of a electric potential, right? Plus V cross. Magnetic field, you can write it as a curl of a vector potential. Right? We have also talked about that. Right? Right? So that's your force, also mass times d2x dt squared. Okay? And quantum mechanics, 
on the other hand, maybe you can tell me what is the law of motion for quantum mechanics or transport equation, fundamental transport equation. So quantum mechanics, uh, here everything is written in terms of x or px, right? And they commute here, right? Meaning x and px are numbers. Similarly, x and px are numbers here. But in quantum mechanics, the fundamental constitutive relation is they are not numbers, but you know, they, they, they don't commute. They're one of, you know, they're oper they're, they're conjugate variables, so they're operators. And the rate of change of a state, a state is now represented not by x or p, you know, where it is, while fast and moving, but by a quant wave function. You know, that's the, the, this is what, what you're tracking in quantum mechanics, right? And that's given by h times psi. Right? This is the trans fundamental transport equation that's you know, kind of the Newton's law, if you might, for quantum states, yeah, so how they evolve. And we also know that uh, if I apply my Hamiltonian operator on any state, which is an eigenvalue, let's say, then I get the energy of that state times that. Right? This is the eigenvalue equation. This is kind of very quick summary of this quantum picture, right? And, and the uh, Hamiltonian can be, you know, p squared by 2m plus any potential you want and all that sort of thing, right? So, and you can have states that are, you can choose states to be orthogonal, you know. Uh, you can write your states in that way that, you know, different, this state is perpendicular to that state, perpendicular to all other states. So that's the Hilbert space picture. Okay, now if you go back and in, in classical mechanics, you can ask this question that, hey, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to go to the potential and I'm going to add a constant potential everywhere. Right? So raise the potential everywhere. Right. And you see it actually doesn't change anything, right? Right? The, if, you, if you raise the constant potential everywhere, then uh, it doesn't change the laws of motion here because the gradient is zero for a constant. Similarly, you can go here in, 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 in electromagnetism and say, hey, well, for electric field, I'm going to add a constant voltage everywhere. Right? And for magnetic field, I'm going to add you know, A plus something here whose curl is zero. I'm going to add something there. And that quantity, if you consider any scalar function and you take the gradient of it, gradient of a curl is always zero. This is an identity. So I can add these things here. This is called a scalar quantity. This is a vector quantity. I can add these quantities here. And it doesn't change my transport at all. It leaves it invariant. Invariant. So these quantities are at least, you know, for f the fancy term for it in physics called gauge. This is what's called a gauge. You add these quantities and nothing changes. These things are gauge invariant. The laws of motion, electromagnetism, laws of motion, classical mechanics are gauge invariant, you know. And these are the gauges you can add uh, and, and not change the laws of motion, right? So the question in quantum mechanics is, is there such a gauge that, that you can add and not change anything in quantum mechanics, right? So, and uh, you know that quantum mechanical states are like vectors, right? And one of the things that you can always do is take a vector and multiply it e to the power i times some phase. You know. Multiply it with some phase and say, well, do the, does the physics of this quantum mechanical system change or does it not change? You know? yeah. So that's, you can consider this as a gauge. You know, there are, this is our gauge that we're choosing right here. So, so, uh, uh, so I think. Uh, one of the things about quantum mechanics is there's always a phase kind of lurking somewhere, and w whether it has physical meaning or not, y you have to figure it out. You know? So, so uh, because a vector, if you multiply by a phase, you can think it kind of changed its direction, but it didn't change its length. You know, because absolute value is still the same. Right? The length is still the same. It didn't change. Yeah. So, uh, so what uh, we can do now is uh, go and ask that. Uh, uh, so what we will find now is, uh, maybe I'll write, write down the result first. What we'll find is we'll, we'll actually, uh, uh, in these laws, in classical laws, what you find is uh, if I have a physical law, what do I mean? Newton's laws or, you know, whatever. Physical laws are gauge invariant, meaning if you are, if you have, if you have a choice of a potential, you know, meaning you can have it here or everything raised by this much. If you have a choice of a gauge, then that the only gauges that are allowed are such that uh, the laws shouldn't change. Physical laws shouldn't change, right? So that's kind of the, that's what a gauge invariant. So physical laws uh, must be gauge invariant. In other words, those are the gauges you can actually choose, right? 
that's, a, that's one way direction. Uh, physical laws, maybe I should write it this way, imply that whatever gauge you choose must be, leave them invariant, right? So quantum mechanics, what, we'll, what you know, Barry finds is he manufactures a gauge, right, uh, which is given by this quantity. So if I have a state n, uh, this is the Berry phase, okay, uh, for state n. It's uh, in the imaginary i times a closed loop integral, and we'll derive this in, 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 in its details, okay, so dot product with n times a gradient in some parameter space times n. And this is a phase, we'll derive that. So here's the question, if I find a gauge uh, which is really not the expectation value of a length or a momentum or some physical quantity. It's not, you know, uh, but then that gauge that I have written down mathematically leaves all the physical laws invariant, right? Uh, does that gauge have a physical meaning, you know? So, so that's kind of an interesting question. It's the upside down question now that uh, we started with physical laws should be gauge invariant. So uh, all gauges you choose should leave the physical law invariant. But in quantum mechanics, Berry phase is a phase that leaves the quantum mechanics invariant. You know? So the question is, is it physical? And you know, over the last 20, 25 years, people have discovered a lot of things which are measurable about the very phase. So it's a really a physical quantity, except it cannot be written as an expectation value of a momentum or some other quantity. It's, it's not that kind of a gauge. You know? so, so it's kind of interesting in that respect as well. Okay, okay so, uh, oh, I'm meeting. <laughs> So, so what I'll uh, do then is uh, give you a, a quick introduction and we can continue this discussion also in the next class. So what is the, how do we define, or how, what is the intuition for Berry phase? So let's say I take, uh, uh, you know, my, my uh, any state, quantum state, say psi 1, okay? W what is this 1? Uh, I'm changing some parameter, maybe the momentum, you know? K can be a proxy for 1. 1 can be here, 2, 3, 4, and all that. They can be on different values of K or different magnetic fields or something like that. Some parameter is changing, okay? And uh, as a result of that parameter changing, the eigenfunction, you know, which is a vector, is also changing. So you can think of this as psi 1, and you go here, this is point 0.1, this is point 0.2 in parameter space, maybe the, it changed a little bit in angle to psi. Two, right? and and then you went here, psi three. It, it changed a little bit like that, maybe. You know, maybe it's changing slowly like that. Right? Does that make sense? And physically, it's a vector in Hilbert space, and it's kind of changing. Its angle is changing as you move along. Each of them is no normalized, so length of each of them is one, you know, because each of them is a normalized wave function. But its phase is changing a little bit, right? So you can ask that: What is the phase difference between state, you know, one? and two, right? State one and state two. What's the angular difference, if you might, you know? This is, I'm, 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 there's always a fear of misleading you in pictures in quantum mechanics because it's much more general than what I'm sketching. So it's not necessarily, but this is kind of a nice way to think about it. So here's some angle here, here's some angle, there's some difference between the two. How do you find the angle difference between two eigenstates in a quantum system? How do you find that? You can take one vector and project on, on the other, right? You take the inner product of the two, psi 1 and psi 2, right? What will I get here? I'll get e to the power some angle, right? right? Let's write it as gamma 1, 2, with the minus sign, times the absolute value of psi 1 and psi 2, you know. So, you know, so this is the phase, this is the magnitude. But that's one. Both are normalized. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. Their phases and all that. So, uh, but they're orthonormal. To, basically, what I'm trying to say is I'm just trying to find the angle between the two, okay? And that, that behavior will give you, I mean, again, they, they don't even have to be the same length, actually, I should say that, you know, so, but, but this is in general true, right? You get the angle between the two. Okay? Now, what is very interesting is I can take this and I, I, I find, uh, I can find then the angle between 1 and 3, 1 and 5, 1 and 10, and all that, right? And I can find these uh, changes in the angles of these. But uh, what you see is if I change each of these, maybe I change this by a gauge, you know, I, I multiply this and change it by some angle, that by some other angle, that by some other angle. I change these gauges I mentioned earlier. 
you know, this angle I will get is not gauge invariant. You know, it basically depends on how much angle I turned each one of them by, how much phase did I turn each one of them by. And this uh, is, uh, so it's essentially we have not yet gotten any gauge invariant quantity. But the moment you do something here, which is slightly different, where you take this path and you close the loop, meaning you go from one to two to three, and you go around this, and you say, what is the total phase change, you know, like this, as I go from here to there, from there to there, and there to there, you get a phase that becomes gauge invariant. Now, that, that phase does not depend if you twist one of those angles or the, another angle by some of it, it remains gauge invariant. And that's kind of a very interesting parameter. What do I mean by that? Let's have a, you know, vector this way, maybe vector that way, and a vector, you know, again, this is qualitative pictures, okay? So this is psi one, this is psi two, this is psi three. These are the wave functions associated at each of these points. You know. And what I'm trying to find now is the phase, you know, this quantity, but for this whole closed path, you know, not just for one to two or two to three, but, but the closed path. So for a closed path, if I take this, you can see that the phases will multiply. I mean, these terms will just multiply, right? And the, this phase will add in the exponent, right? One to two, two to three, three to one. In a closed path, right? And so this quantity here, so essentially this phase, g gamma, you know, going from one to two to three to two to one. Oh, sorry, three to one. Sorry, right? It goes like that. And I can write this quantity as the, arg you know, uh, f phase as. Uh, let me just this is called the argument. Uh, I hope you are, you know, comfortable with this quantity. Any complex number can be written as, you know, e to the power. I R Z times mod Z, you know, so something like that, right? The the angle is the argument, uh, you know, e to the power i theta uh, of this quantity, you know, going from psi one to psi two, then go from psi two to psi three to psi three to psi one. Right? So you come back to where you started. Okay. Does it make sense? I mean, this times that, and, and the angles here are adding up. Right? Okay. So now, this quantity here uh, is uh, uh, what I mean to say. That, so this, this quantity can be written in a slightly different way. The argument, mathematically, you can think of these now as, uh, remember we talked also about the Dirac notation on these. These states are really vectors. You know? I mean, these are four by one, or you know, so these are vectors. And these are basically matrices. You're multiplying matrices of state one, state two, state two, state three, and all that, right? And the argument of a, of a product of matrices is equal to, uh, this is a result that uh, we, have, you know, we can use, is equal to the trace of the matrices. Trace means you multiply all the matrices and you sum all the diagonal elements, right? That's the trace. And the trace does not care which order you put them in. You know? Trace of a B is equal to trace of B A. Matrices, you know, the matrices may not commute, but the traces are the same. They don't care about which order you multiply them in. So here, I can rearrange it and write it as, you know, psi two. So I can take this and put it over there. And so essentially, I'm writing it in a slightly different way now. And psi one and psi one. Oops, sorry. So now you can see this is two, three, and one. And uh, so if I choose to go this way, I will get some value. And if I now go in and do some sort of a gauge transformation and multiply each of them by some phases, you'll see that it won't change at all. You know? Why? Because each gauge, e to the power i alpha two, e to the power minus alpha two cancel out here. e to the power alpha three minus alpha, they cancel out here. They all cancel out, right? But so the path, you know, uh, once you go around here, this argument or this angle that you get is, is gauge invariant. It doesn't depend on how you gauge it out. You know? So as a result, this uh, is a gauge invariant quantity in quantum mechanics. And this is exactly what's the Berry phase. You know? in, 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 and in a little more detail, we'll do it in a continuous phase. This is a discrete version of it. And uh, uh, so, uh, the, the, okay, just to repeat my argument again, uh, so the, uh, each of them you can multiply by e to the power i alpha one and e to the power minus i alpha one and all that. 
but they'll all cancel out inside here. And this whole path now, once you close the loop, this whatever you get here, the phase one to you know for a closed loop, for a closed loop, if you or maybe put a circle here showing it's a closed loop. If it's a closed path, then this is gauge, gauge invariant. And this is what's called the Berry phase of any quantum system, not necessarily, you know. So where you have a path where you are moving along, and this path could be many things. It could be the magnetic field we talked about. It could, because in the magnetic field, you are changing the wave functions, and you then bring it back to where you were. And when you brought it back, did it change? Did it not change? It could be the momentum, crystal momentum. It can be more like that, right? So, so and all that. So, uh, so the, uh, what I'll show in the next class is uh, uh, something very interesting happens if you go from a picture like this to pictures where you actually have uh, a closed, uh, you know, instead of a flat surface like this, a curved surface, uh, for example, a torus, and you can now put on it a grid of points, you know, like this, you know, these points, like we chose these points here, now you put it on a torus, and something very interesting happens, and we'll see that the the Berry phase will become quantized there, you know, or aspect of a Berry phase, the curvature, uh, the, the integral of the Berry phase will become quantized. And that quantization is responsible for the quantum Hall effect. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll connect it to that story. Okay? I've given you some hints right now, but, you know, uh, if you understand what is the Berry phase, the rest of it will be, a, you know, kind of um, easy, e easy understanding after that. But uh, the basic concept of it is just that, you know, is that the, as you, for closed paths, in quantum mechanics, um, uh, you, 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 you can get a phase that's gauge invariant. And that's kind of interestingly missing for you know, more than half a century after the discovery of quantum mechanics. It was only recently discovered in some sense. Okay, so, so we'll follow up on, from here on, on Tuesday uh, next week then. Okay, okay good.